regular meeting on Monday, September 8th, 2008. Uh, can I have the roll call, please? Yes. Um, Chairman Lynch. Present. Councillor Backer. Here. Councillor Hill. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor McKenney. Here. Councillor Rowe. Here. And Councillor Swift Kayata. Here. Okay. Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, the next item, or the first item on our agenda is the minutes of our meetings of August 11th and August 18th. Jim? I would move that we accept the uh, minutes from August 11th. Would you like them handled together? I think they can be handled together. Okay. Uh, I would move that we accept the minutes uh, from the Monday, August 11th meeting and from the Monday, August 18th meeting as submitted. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? That would be 7-0. Okay. Reports and correspondence. Okay, well, I will just mention that, our, as I usually do this time of year, our farmers markets are all open despite the rainfall in August. The harvest is plentiful, and I know um, people in Cape Elizabeth treasure their farms, and Bill Jordan, the late Bill Jordan, once when I asked him, um, what can we do to preserve our farms? Bill said, buy our vegetables. So I would encourage everyone to um, purchase their vegetables locally at the local farm markets. And also at this time, the Cape Farm Alliance, which is a citizens group, um, which has been sponsored in part by Councillor Jim Rowe, I know is selling Cape Farm Alliance t-shirts to support their wonderful website. So um, I would just make note of that issue. And secondly, I would note that the Shore Road Path Committee has um, tentatively scheduled a public forum for November 19th. So I would encourage people who have an interest to watch the town website. Michael, town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Marianne. Just wanted to give a brief update on Spurwink Avenue. Uh, I'm very pleased that most of the paving is now done, or all the paving is now done. There was some sense that the state portion, <coughs> the, the part that was done early, that there was no local funding involved in that. I've, I've heard a couple of people say, well, you know, what's the issue? It was funded by the state. And I just wanted to point out that the, the town budget did contribute $288,000 as this local share toward that project. And we also, we just paved it totally at 100% local expense the section from the electric substation to Paputa Club, and that was another 70000 So it, it, we did, in fact, spend $358,000 of, of local taxpayer dollars uh, on the improvements to Spurwink, and we, we appreciate everyone's patience and very happy that, that it's done. We also have begun paving a little bit in, in Sherwood Forest across in Fort Williams, the loop of Old Fort and Little John. Uh, that's partially done, and... Uh, Again, we're, you know, with being careful, liquid asphalt is very expensive. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's a number of our roads that are, that are just in, in real difficult shape. And uh, we're trying to get them done uh, as much as we can. Uh, all of the paving that is being done has been done based on bids. Uh, either the MDOT received a bid, and we also, we did for our local paving, it was through a bid through COG, which includes the, the other part of Spurwink as well as what we've done over in Sherwood Forest. So. Just wanted to update you on that. We also had a very nice employee luncheon, which I think is since the last meeting. I appreciate the counselors uh, who attended that, and want to especially indicate appreciation to Deborah Lane uh, for all that. nice, nice luncheon. Thank and you. I would just mention that that luncheon is accompanied by um, continuing education for all town employees, which is why the town office is closed that morning. So it's. Uh, an opportunity for the town to make sure that the employees are provided the training that's often required by state or federal law. Um, it's not a day off for them, and uh, we appreciate their participating in that. Okay, 
The next item on the agenda is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. And I know we have um, one citizen, Lauren Hadiaris, who is here. And uh, I will just apologize to Lauren. She come right up to the podium. Uh, she had hoped to get on the agenda, but her email went into my spam filter. And so instead of being on our agenda, she'll be providing some information on uh, some research that she has done. Hi, um, my name is Lauren Hedieris. I'm going. I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth, and I'm a senior at Winkley School. Last year, I took um, environmental science, and for the second semester, we had an independent, substantial research project. And you were writing an environmental assessment on an issue in your town. Um, so my parents, before I get to the issue, always have my brother and I drive our waste and recyclables to the transfer station. And usually, we're going at the end of the day, and our car is idling, waiting in line to drop it off. And I realized that I was really wasting gas and carbon dioxide was being emitted into the atmosphere, which didn't need to be. So my issue was overabundance of carbon dioxide in Cape Elizabeth due to the resident delivery system. Um, and over, the reason that's a problem is the overabundance of carbon dioxide contributes to global warming, which could lead to a potential rise in temperature, which would affect everyone. Cape Elizabeth has many ecosystems. We have freshwater ponds, we have the ocean, marshes, wooded forests, and fields, all of which are valued for their agriculture and recreation and a rise in temperature would affect all these ecosystems, the plants, the animals, which could be around here. Um, my assumption was that there would be a greater carbon dioxide output from the resident delivery system of waste disposal versus curbside. Um, throughout this project, I found out that the resident delivery to the transfer station produces an estimated carbon dioxide output of 1,431,683 pounds a year. That's my estimation. <laughs> And that curbside pickup would produce an estimated carbon dioxide output of 138,528 pounds. So Cape Elizabeth, the resident delivery system of waste disposal to the transfer station, is adding an additional a million pounds of carbon dioxide, which would not be needed to add to the environment. And to find this, the carbon dioxide output of Cape Elizabeth, I had to come up with some kind of math formation to figure out the carbon dioxide output. Um, so there are a few variables I had to figure out to do that. I had to figure out how many households were in Cape Elizabeth. So I used the Cape Elizabeth Tax Assessors database, and I got a map. And the estimated number of households I got was 3,695. Um, I did this because there are different assessor areas, and I would count the houses in that area. I also needed to figure out how many um, the typical round trip that people were taking in that area to the transfer station. Um, and I talked to Pat Anderson, who works there, and she told me that there's about the same volume of trash every week. So I assumed that people were going once a week. So I would pick a um, street in the middle of the area or the street with most residents, and I would find out with the Lauren mapping software the distance from that street to the transfer station. I also need to know the average mile per gallon for Cape Elizabeth vehicles. So my mother and I went to the transfer station one day, and mid-morning, morning, in the afternoon, and we calculated which cars were going into the transfer station, the different types. And 23% were SUVs, 14% were station wagons, 28% were pickup trucks, 12% were vans, and 23% were sedans. And this is on the Cape Elizabeth Transfer Station vehicle sampling results in my project. And then I went to the EPA fuel economy guide to figure out their average city miles per gallon. And I did an equation, and I figured that it was 16.53 for the average town for the city mile per gallon for cars. Um, once I had that, I was able to put it into math equation to figure out the carbon dioxide output, and it was the number of households multiplied by the typical round, typical round trip miles times 52 weeks in a year to get the total annual miles of 1,183,286 1, um, miles. And I did each assessor area into that equation and then added it all up. Um, then I did the total annual miles divided by the average miles per gallon, which was 16.53, to get total gallons of 71,584. And then I did total annual gallons times 20, which is the carbon dioxide output per one gallon of gas, which gave me 1,430,683 pounds of carbon dioxide. Um, it was much easier to do the carbon dioxide output for possible curbside delivery in Cape Elizabeth. I was given this information from Pine Tree Waste Company, which um, does it for the town of Cumberland. I talked to EcoMaine, and they told me that this would be the best town size comparison because Cumberland um, is 25 square miles compared to Capes 15, but has lesser, it has less households. Cumberland has 2,924 housing units compared to Cape Elizabeth's 3,695. 
And Pine Tree Waste Company has one truck for Cumberland, and it goes once a week to pick up trash and recyclables. So then I, Pine Tree Waste told me that the car travels 350 miles a week, and it uses 120 gallons of diesel fuel weekly. And 120 gallons times 52 weeks equals 6,240 gallons of diesel fuel annually. Um, diesel fuel, one gallon, emits more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, 22.2, as compared to gasoline's 20. So it's 22.2 times 6,240 to get 138,528 pounds of carbon dioxide. And when I did this project, you had to take in cost considerations and sentiment for the public for the issue that we're doing. And I know that many people love the transfer station, and they love going to the swap shop. And it's kind of more of a community thing than it is in other towns. And um, so I took a few things in to make it a little easier to consider. Um, Pine Tree Waste only, well, does not only, it's a large sum, um, charges Cumberland for one year, $363,374. And my estimate for Cape Elizabeth as a whole spending on gasoline is $263,429. And that's not adding in um, the fee to have our waste shipped over to EcoMaine. So when you add that, it's a bit closer, but curbside is still a lot more. Um, I think that curbside pickup could further increase Cape Elizabeth's recycling rates, it could reduce traffic impact on local roads, and mainly for me, it could reduce Cape Elizabeth's carbon footprint. And I recommend that you um, evaluate curbside pickup, possibly when there's a new budget done, to really figure out how much the transfer station is costing in comparison with curbside. And I think that if Cape Elizabeth residents were aware of the carbon footprint, it would be easier for them to listen to suggestions or just become more aware and cut back on the driving that they're doing to the transfer station. <laughs> thank you very much. Lauren, thank you very much. Uh, your research is really impressive. It's very timely. We have a workshop this Thursday night where we are beginning to explore um, the issues of uh, curbside pickup and pay per bag. So your research will be something that we'll all look at. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Lauren. Okay, we'll start with Cynthia. I don't have, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I just think you did such an excellent job at presenting information. I mean, you're really talented in presenting a lot of information in a very uh, easy to understand uh, manner. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Hope you got an A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I hope you got an A too, because I must say I don't usually gush over <laughs> reports, but. I love the focus on facts. I thought, I thought this was just awesome. This is one of the best reports I've gotten as a town councilor in terms of a new proposal from somebody. Um, I, I really am very impressed. So thank you. I think we will put this to actual use. You know, it won't be a report that just disappears. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Paul? Lauren, I, I'd Lauren. like to say this is a wonderful job that you did. And I'd, I'd also say that you're on to something very important. This issue is extremely important, not just for Cape Elizabeth, but for our nation in the, in the world in general. And I think um, this environmental science might be a nice uh, thing to study in college for someone as bright as you. Thanks. Do you mind if I ask you who your teacher was? Oh, um, Jennifer Rosenfield. He used to live in Cape Elizabeth, and I believe he was on the Conservation Commission. It would be nice just to drop him an email and tell him what a great job you did. Thank you again. And uh, you're welcome to our workshops, um, but we will be bringing this with us. So thank you very much. Great job. Thanks, Wonderful. Excellent work. OK. The first item on our agenda, um, or the next item, is item 119, which is the residential windmills. And I know that. Um, <coughs> Councillor Dill has a report of the Ordinance Committee. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. And to put things in context, um, I'll just briefly give some background. Um, as many of you know, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council has since um, 2006, I believe, had as one of its goals to explore alternative energy. And um, there's been some various um, approaches. We have the Alternative Energy Committee. We have recycling that we're looking at. We've done energy audits. Um, and we also had, um, about a year ago, a request by a citizen who's present here to um, put up a windmill. Um, and at that point, there was a discussion amongst councillors um, 
about the utilization of wind energy and it was referred, the issue was referred to the planning board because the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance as it was um, enacted did not allow for windmills in Cape Elizabeth. So the planning board studied the issue and recommended to the town council certain proposals. The first proposal was a pilot project which the ordinance committee recommended and the town council approved in um, July of this year and so that um, project is, is moving forward. Um, the second issue was allowing residential windmills in Cape Elizabeth and initially the planning board's proposal wasn't accepted um, uh, fully because we didn't feel it had um, enough um, precautions to balance the needs of neighbors and the aesthetic environmental piece with the um, goal to explore alternative energy. So the town council had a workshop and at the workshop we had with us um, alternative energy uh, ordinances from other communities and we had a list of concerns and questions that we discussed and ultimately came up with some performance standards that addressed um, some of the issues that we felt were important like setbacks, noise limitations, color, um, <clears throat> what happens when the windmill is no longer in use, whether or not we need site plan review, those sorts of things. Um, as a result of the town council workshop, the ordinance committee, meeting, ordinance committee met again and we refined what is now um, the zoning ordinance for the, um, the town council tonight to consider following a public hearing. And essentially the um, amendment that we are recommending as the Ordinance Committee is an amendment to the Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance, Section 19-1-3, that would include a definition of a wind energy system, which actually that definition was adopted, but tonight under consideration is to allow wind energy systems in the residential districts within Cape Elizabeth for lots, um, 20,000 square feet or more. Um, essentially, in a nutshell, the proposed amendment has the following provisions. <laughs> One, that the windmill um, applicant does not need to have site plan review, but does need to get a building permit. That the minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet. That the setbacks are 110%. Are and that the performance standards, which appear in section 19-8-13, which deal with um, the fact that there can only be one wind energy system per lot, how tall the tower can be, where the blades have to be in relation to the earth or other structures, um, various safety uh, measures about signage, um, lighting, wiring, etc. <coughs> and so I am proposing and moving that the council <coughs> tonight um, approve the amendments as they are set forth in the packet um, and would, uh, like I said, amend the zoning ordinance section 19-1-3 through 19-18-13. Is there a second? Second the motion. Okay. Is there discussion? Ian? Um, this is, uh, a citizen called me this afternoon and I said that I would bring his concern to the attention of the council. Um, you can see we have before us, I don't know if anybody else has access to this, but it's a map that shows all the lots in town that are 20,000 square feet or over. The concern this is, and those are the lots where a windmill could conceivably be permitted. Uh, the concern of this particular citizen, um, who is in favor of wind power, by the way, um, was that uh, because of shoreland zoning rules and wetback, oh, wetback, wetland <laughs> setbacks, sorry, um, that there would be, in his estimation, a fair number of lots in town wh whose owners might be interested in <coughs> wind power but wouldn't be able to because of that. And he was concerned that um, because of the shoreland zoning um, rules and the wetland setback rules, that those are places, especially along the shore, where wind is most likely to be strong enough to um, make, it a vi make a wind turbine a viable energy source. So he wanted to know if there was any modification that we could do that could address that issue. 
Um, I've spoken with a couple of the counselors, and I can't think of any modification, but I did want to bring this to your attention. Um, the shoreland zoning rules, I believe, are state rules. I, I, Maureen's here. She may want to address some of this, but um, I, I promised that I would bring this to your attention on behalf of the citizens. So, Do you have a question for Maureen? Is, is there any way, the citizen wanted to know if there was any way to <coughs> modify this ordinance in, uh, in some fashion that would make people make the setbacks having to do with wetlands or shoreland uh, setbacks any less restrictive? Um, I'm going to give you a two-part answer. The first part is that, yes, the shoreland zoning is state mandated. We have a 75-foot setback for structures. So um, in the short term, I, I don't see if there would be anything you could do. The longer term answer is that the, the state requires towns to adopt shoreland zoning consistent with the state minimum rules. They have just updated their rules and we are looking at a deadline of July 2009 to come into compliance with those new rules. So my hope is that I'll be standing before you sometime next March with a new set of amendments and at that time the council could consider putting something in there that um, treats windmills differently and we can send it to the state and see if they'll accept it. Okay, thank you. I, I'm not proposing, obviously, since we don't even know what's going to be happening next year, but I, I, I'm bringing this question up just so that the rest of the council could be aware of it and, so, and also because I committed to this particular citizen that I would bring it up. So. Can I just ask Maureen a quick question? Do you have a rough estimate of how many lots that would affect? Are we talking 50 or five? I, I wouldn't stand here and try to give you that. Cape Elizabeth has a lot of shoreland zoning. Mm -hmm. Just to, to clarify, the question was asked shoreland setback. I, if it's the same citizen who spoke to me this afternoon, I think the, the, the issue is RP1 setback with this particular citizen. Well, so, so the information you gave isn't, would not be consistent for which but you, you did answer the question based on the question up, that you up asked. Up to a point, up to a point, because a lot of our RP1 zoning is also state mandated. Um, and I, I mean, obviously there are individual circumstances that differ, but I have to say that typically your best wind is in the higher elevations and your wetlands are in the lower elevations. So I'm a little skeptical that we have a lot of resource protection zoning that are, is going to contradict. But the setback is also not 75 feet for no, it the RP1. No, it isn't. It's a, the RP1 buffer is 250 feet. You're allowed, not allowed any structure within the RP1 buffer. So, you know, the Spurwink Marsh, a lot of wind. Is there enough wind to generate windmills? I don't know, but definitely the marsh is subject to the RP1 setback. I just wanted to clarify that before I get Thank the call you. in the morning. That, it yeah. sounds like <laughs> it's too co more complicated than we would for us to address tonight without a lot more work. I have uh, a concern. Um, I am concerned about allowing the uh, windmills at this point because on lot sizes of 20,000 square feet to 40,000. I think that um, this is a great experiment and um, I support it, but I think the worst thing we can do is put windmills in tight areas and have neighbors complaint. And I would rather us go a little more slowly and um, adopt this ordinance as recommended by the ordinance committee, but um, amend the minimum lot size to 40,000 square feet, see how that works, and then come back, if it's working well and it's successful, then come back and look at amending the ordinance to allow it for um, smaller lots. So I would like to um, make a motion to um, have an amendment um, to have the minimum lot size be 40,000 square feet. And I'm waiting for a second, and maybe it won't get one, but, well, it's going to. Oh, can you just second it for the sake of discussion? Yes, you can. I'd like to second it. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor, and it's been seconded. Do we have to deal with that you, first? You, I think you deal with the amendment first, Jim, okay. and you go to the, Ann, um, Cynthia. I, I had. Uh, the same question in my own mind and so what I tried to look at was for um, a, a one acre lot is 43 
basically 43,000 square feet. If, if it were a square lot, and I know some lots are long and skinny, but a square lot, I believe that would be a little over 200 feet. It would be 200 feet by 200 feet. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if you, if you have a parcel that's you know, 200 by 200, with the, with the setbacks being 110%, I, I just, I don't think that you're going to have too many lots where you're even... That's for a 40,000 square foot. I know, but so I'm saying, yeah. so if you even shrink that even more, if you shrink that to sort of half that size, then I, I don't think it's going to well, end up being an issue. I don't think you could, even though we're saying 20,000 square feet, I'm not sure you could actually get, you'd have to have a really well, short I, tower I, to reach the 110%. I was looking at some hypotheticals that suggested that, and I don't know if it's doable, but you could put it, I could, for instance, put a windmill, I think, on the roof of my home, and I'm on a lot that's smaller than 40,000 square feet. Um, actually, just to, for clarification, windmills don't work on roofs, it will it'll, uh, destabilize your structure. They have to be. I, I'm concerned that we're going to allow it over most of the town without really understanding the impact. So I mean, I'd really like to see us. As it is, we're going to allow it. If we went with 40,000, we'd allow it through all of the blue area on this map, which is quite a bit of the town. And I, I don't know that we've had any requests from anyone under 40,000 square feet to put a windmill. Uh, Cynthia? I am not supporting your amendment, respectfully, because I think that the performance standards that we are proposing be enacted really um, sort of address all of the issues, at least in my opinion, that any neighbor in a small, more condensed neighborhood would have. For instance, um, there is the height restriction, there's the setback restriction, but I think the biggest objection that people have to windmills are, uh, is the noise That's right. and the sight of them. And the performance standards include, in Section 10 specifically, that the wind energy system shall not exceed 55 decibels at the property line. And so if it's, if it's not noisy and it's neutral colored and it's within the setbacks, I just don't see why someone with a smaller lot should be deprived of the opportunity at exploring alternative energy. Um, and so that's why I'm not supporting your amendment. Okay. If you're all lining up not to support it, we can just take a vote on it. <laughs> uh, Jim and then Ann. Uh, I agree with Councillor Dill. We discussed this uh, in the Ordinance Committee, and the most critical performance standard to me was the uh, setback and the height. Uh, because you could have a 40,000 square foot lot and position the tower as close as you're allowed to the property line and it wouldn't be any more uh, or less uh, egregious than putting it uh, with the same setback on a 20,000 square foot lot. And I agree with uh, Councillor Dill's comments, and we'll, we'll vote against your motion, your amendment. Anne? And, and I am speaking against it, but I think this might add to the conversation, only because if you have a 20,000, I just re-cranked the math, if you have a 20,000 square foot lot, that's 141 by 141, which means in the middle of it, if you have to have the 110% fall zone, the highest you could have is a 63-foot tower there if it was precisely in the middle. I think that's, first of all, unlikely that you'd put it precisely in the middle. Um, and I don't think people are going to put them on top of their houses. The average tree height was quoted in our, or, uh, in our workshop as 90 feet, so that would be below the trees. So I don't, think it's, I don't think it's even going to be an issue. And then on top of that, I think we have all the performance standards. So if, if that makes you, if that reassures you at all. We'll take a vote on the amend, amendment first. All in favor? Show that to be 6-1. <laughs> and now we're back to the main motion. David. Um, two comments. Um, First of all, for Councillor Dill, and I may be missing the obvious here, but there's also a chance that something was omitted inadvertently. Um, from Section 19.813, the performance standards. Yes. Was there intended to be a height limitation of 100 feet? 
Yes. Um, Maureen knows it. Yeah, it, I'm either missing it or it's in there, and I'm, again, I'm missing the obvious. I wonder if the planner has the answer to that. It's in there. We just we know. put it in each district, so you just need to look in a different section. So, for example, on the pages where the actual text are, if you look on page, so uh, let's just pick a page. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see it. It was there in a previous. Let's let there. Maureen um, find it for us, and and it's you're right, it is missing. It's missing. Absolutely. There was a prior draft where we had placed the height in the um, the actual district, so it would be on page three, page four. So page I think five. the amendment would it's be gone. in order for a hundred foot height limit. Is there such an amendment? I'll, I'll second that amendment. Okay. Second. A discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor? Well, I'm sorry. I just want to. I, well, I, I'm quickly going through our previous drafts to see though where because I've looked at so many drafts of this ordinance. So thank you, Councillor Backer, for raising that issue. But I just want to be clear that we're not missing it again. That it's tucked in someplace. So I'm certainly in favor of it, but I. I want to make sure we're... I know it was an element that we discussed at our workshop. So I assume the intent is that it be there. Yeah, I... <coughs> Madam Chair. <coughs> yes, if I might. Uh, it, I have the previous drafts here, and it was in the previous drafts. So I think it was just inadvertently left out. <coughs> draft. Yes, in the previous draft, there was a minimum setback and then a maximum small wind energy system height, all uses to center of turbine 100 feet. And I don't know if it's just not in this packet, but it's been in all the previous packets. So, yes, I'm certainly um, in favor of including the language maximum small wind energy system height in every district not to exceed 100 feet. Okay, so we have a motion to amend the ordinance that's been moved um, and that amendment has been seconded and thank you David for that cast. Yes. All in favor? That would be 7-0. <clears throat> now we're back to the main motion. I, I said that I had two comments. That was the first one. Okay. Um, the I'll try to second, dispose of the next one is the uh, <laughs> the the next one. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to take a contrary view on this, and I realize there's wide support for this, and to some extent, I'm glad there is. Um, what we've learned through this process, um, my understanding is that there's an expectation that there is not an abundance of lots where wind will be sufficient to justify the expense of a wind turbine. Um, the number of acceptable wind locations appears to be relatively small. Um, the economic payback is not rapid. In fact, we've heard to the contrary that it's measured in years and in some cases many years. Um, and the expectation, although we again don't know for sure, is that a relatively small number of landowners will likely opt to install a wind turbine. Um, I fully support encouraging municipalities, government entities, um, to explore wind and other non-traditional sources to provide um, power needs that will serve the public good. I support the concept of our energy suppliers pursuing uh, non-traditional sources to supply power to serve the public good. My concern, though, is that a private wind turbine in a place like Texas or Oklahoma where there are no views to protect may not offend sensibilities of the public. But I'm afraid that in Cape Elizabeth, where a view of the ocean is tremendously valued, as evidenced by assessed values, um, of lots either on the ocean or with a view of the ocean, um, that a private wind turbine 
that serves a limited private interest risks interfering with views that the broader public value greatly. And one of the comments that we heard during our public hearing was from somebody who said, I support the concept of public turbines, uh, public wind towers, but you need to protect the public views, the, the valuable view sheds, meaning the views of the ocean. Well, the ironic thing about that statement, of course, is that the most likely place for one of these towers to be erected is on the ocean, where it's likely to interfere with views. And for the select few people or property owners for whom the economics and wind exposure might make a wind turbine a logical option, I think there's a great risk that a larger number of people will be offended by it um, and will be disappointed by the presence of those turbines. You know, fortunately, the one turbine we have here in town on 77 um, is set back in and above the trees and off the road where no views are obstructed. It's sort of the ideal place for there to be a turbine and for nobody to care um, and for it to serve the benefit of the property owner. And if a greater number of people would benefit from this proposed ordinance, um, I'd be more inclined to support it, but weighing the few number of people likely to derive an economic benefit and the limited economic benefit to be derived from those few people who will put them up, weighed against the risk of a, number of a greater number of people being offended by the presence of them, I'm not quite ready to support it. Although, politically, all the other forces that we're facing right now worldwide with our dependence on oil, argue for support of giving people the right to become more energy independent, but the thrust of my argument is that it's municipalities that should be erecting these, or government entities, or the power suppliers that should be looking to the alternatives, um, not private residential property owners. So with some reluctance, I will not be supporting it. First, I have a question. Do we have any ordinance in place, Michael, that protects the public view? No. no. We do not. Okay, we have nothing. I think David brings up a, a valid point. I, I don't agree with the argument in its entirety because I'm more inclined to support the uh, individual property owner and the fact that um, we are so dependent on fossil fuels has caused so many problems for us, not only as a, uh, <clears throat> as a community. I mean, just look at the skyrocketing price of oil and what it's done to the school budget and the town budget. But um, as American citizens, and I think we need to be very concerned about that. You know, um, the more dependent we remain on oil, the more we're going to uh, have problems throughout the world whether it's totalitarian dictatorships that cling to power because they have money, because of the high price of oil, or it's uh, the fact that we're facing global warming, which is going to affect all of us. And I think we need to do everything that we can reasonably to um, wean ourselves off of that dependence. And I think this is one small measure that can help in that regard. And I don't think there's a big economic payback for an individual to put up a windmill, but I think what it does is it creates, it does two things. First of all, it's symbolic in the sense that somebody's trying to do something about it, uh, about their dependence on oil. And secondly, it takes them off the grid to a certain extent, and that power gets put back onto the grid for others to use. It's clean power. And the more we can support clean and, and green power, I think the better off we, we will be in the future. Aesthetically, there will be a, a, some effect, just as there is when, when we put up cell towers. But I think the payoff overrides the, um, the small possible degradation in aesthetic effect. And the other aspect of this that uh, makes me want to support it is, be, is the fact that uh, the Ordinance Committee limited the height to 100 feet. And we were told that the average height of the trees is 90 feet. 
So we're not talking about a 200 foot tower, um, you know, over the landscape of Cape Elizabeth. I, I was in, uh, recently in Kingston and I shared this with the manager. Um, they have uh, one community that's putting eight square miles of wind turbines in, 250 feet in the air, each turbine uh, approximately 125 feet long. I mean, that's, that would be an aesthetic change for sure. But I, I, don't think, I don't feel the same way about this. I think this is minor. I don't think there'll be a lot of people taking advantage of it, but I hope there are some. And I think it's in our best interest to do whatever we can to get off the, our dependence on fossil fuels. Cynthia, just, and okay, just, I just want to briefly note that um, with respect to David's comments about the public view and the potential impact a wind tower might have on that, I would just note that, again, the performance standards, specifically number eight, um, would mandate that all the wiring associated with the wind tower be underground. And so essentially the wind tower would have the same visual impact as a flagpole. And we all know that there have been flagpoles um, put up along the shore um, hopefully within the setback, some within, some without, but that's another issue. Um, so, I, it's a, so every property owner has, you know, within those setbacks and various um, other, um, you know, limitations can put up a 100-foot flagpole, so I don't see why a wind tower is really any different. Ian? Um, I'm going to respectfully disagree with with David's analysis for a couple of reasons. I do think that the public does benefit. Paul alluded to this. Um, I don't think it is just one, one person or one homeowner that benefits. Yes, it would be their own uh, windmill that would uh, sort of directly benefit. But I think if a lot of people did it, then the public would um, benefit for the use of green power, as Paul termed it. Um, I think we all will benefit from uh, not relying on fossil fuels so much. So that's one reason. Another reason I think is that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And um, there has been, ever, ever since this area and any place was developed at all, and I mean back in the 1600s um, or, or before, I think there's always, always has and always will be in the minds of people a conflict between the wild and the impact of civilization or technology. And so I get a little nervous because if, I, I, I don't understand how we can pick out a windmill or a wind turbine and say that's an, uh, a, a non-wild thing that we don't like, but that houses along the shore are okay. I mean, they in some ways spoil the wild view. Portland Headlight, which was cutting edge technology when it was built, um, certainly sticks up pretty high. And you know, some people maybe thought that spoiled the view. Um, but I think it served a greater good. And, uh, and I think it's become a beloved uh, landmark now. So uh, again, you know, I, I, I think windmills could be more beautiful than zillions of telephone poles up and down the streets all over town. So it's just what people are used to. Um, and thirdly, my last reason um, for respectfully disagreeing and for supporting the um, original motion is that I, I get a little concerned, or more than a little concerned, when an individual property owner is um, not able to use his own land for his own purposes because somebody else as long as it falls within the regular zoning rules that have to do with public safety and setbacks and all the performance standards that, that will apply to windmills. I get concerned when we say the public, somebody else, is going to dictate to me what I can build on my property because they don't like that it will spoil their view of my property. And, and I understand that's natural, but it, I also am a believer in property rights, and if somebody owns their property and they're doing something that isn't harming anybody else, and you know, I, it's a slippery slope. You could start saying, "I don't, I don't like people if they, to paint their houses purple," and I don't like people who, you know, have houses that are a, a weird architectural style, or, you know, it, so I get really concerned about those questions of aesthetics. 
So for those reasons, I, I'm not, not buying your argument, and I would like to support the original motion. David, you won't be alone. I, um, one of the reasons I sponsored my last amendment was because I think most of the view sheds are um, in these tightly compact neighborhoods. And while I generally would agree with Ann on the rights of property owners to put on their land what, um, what, they, what they want and what is lawful, I would also point out that until we take a vote on this, windmills are not lawful. Mm -hmm. And um, people bought property in particular neighborhoods um, not expecting, in some cases, to have a windmill next door to them. Um, I also think that if there was a greater public good argument, it would be worth it. But to the extent that um, you still have to build fossil fuel or other baseload capacity to um, run the electric grid when the windmills aren't running, um, they're of somewhat marginal um, public benefit, even using Anne's greater good argument. So um, I might have been able to support it with um, just larger lots, but um, I think that um, on the smaller lots, as I look in um, the, uh, especially the Broad Cove and Shore Acre neighborhoods, um, uh, I certainly, if I li and I don't live in either of those neighborhoods, but if I did, I might say, gee, I didn't anticipate that neighbors on either side of me would put windmills up. So we've all spoken on it, and I guess we can take a vote. So, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five. And opposed? Two. And show that to be Lynch and Backer opposed. Thank you. Okay, windmills are lawful. The next item on the agenda is a public, first, uh, it's a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance. So I will open this up to public hearing. If there's anyone who would like to speak to this issue. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Okay. Take the microphone back. <laughs> okay. It's clear that no one in town has gotten too worked up about the proposal. Um, and so the, I, ne now that the public hearing is closed, um, we have before us the proposed amendments to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance. Um, this was in our package last month. It was referred to the ordinance committee. Does the ordinance committee have a recommendation? We, yes, as chair of the ordinance committee, we propose that the amendments as set forth in our packet uh, to the miscellaneous offenses ordinance be adopted. Okay, and that, is that a motion? Yes, that was a motion. Thank is you. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Discussion? Ann? Jim? Um, I uh, have my only concern, my only question with this is on the last page, the one having to do with smoking, about smoke uh, section 12.4.6 smoking. Smoking of tobacco products is not permitted within the confines of Fort Williams Park or on the adjacent Portland Headlight parcel. I speak as someone who is not a smoker and I don't let people smoke in my house <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not a big proponent of smoking. I realize it's not healthy and everything but I'm also very hesitant to pass laws that I think are well nigh impossible to enforce. I just think it's sort of crazy. So I'd, I'd be inter I'm, I'm open to persuasion on this one, but I would like to hear other counselors' thoughts on the smoking issue. If I might, since yes. I'm the one who proposed this, I propose this um, as a litter ordinance because, um, and, and I don't smoke, and but I don't care whether other people smoke. However, people get out of their cars and they get off the tour buses and they go right to the beginning of the cliff walk 
and they stand around there and have their cigarettes, and then they put their cigarettes out, their butts, and they leave them there. The park has a carry-in, carry-out policy for all other litter. And it just strikes me, and you go along the cliff walk, and there's cigarette butts all over the place. So I know smokers won't put their cigarette butts in their pockets and carry them out. So it strikes me that as a litter ordinance, that's the way to resolve a public waste issue. And And I was aware that it was a, a litter. The reason you brought it up was for as an anti-littering um, reason. But um, uh, I don't know. I just think it's, it's extremely hard to enforce. And I'm also aware of. Um, one person who uh, is on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission did send us an email and asked if we had consulted the Fort Williams Advisory Commission on this matter. And I know we don't have to, but it strikes me that we almost always do ask them when we make changes to policies at the fort. So that was another concern I had. Jim? Uh, that was my point uh, as well. We did receive a, a letter from a member of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, not on behalf of the Commission, but as a uh, private citizen, uh, who would be interested in bringing that issue uh, before the Advisory Commission for discussion. I, I really see no urgency in passing this tonight. Um, and I would also include uh, a proposal to, to refer 12-4-8, which is the pet excrement removal uh, section, which I had proposed, um, to the Advisory Commission as well. Uh, to me personally, the, the, the uh, dog feces is more of a problem than cigarette butts in my mind that are unretrieved and lie near the path. Um, but uh, I see no urgency in passing this, these uh, amendments tonight, uh, in, a, in their entirety at least, and I would have no problem at all referring the smoking and the uh, pet feces uh, sections to the Advisory Commission for review. And I don't know how other. Uh, I would make that a motion, but I, I, I'd first like to canvas informally the rest of the council. I don't need, uh, if they feel it has merit, I, I'd, I'd like to see it uh, made into a motion. If not, then I'm not going to live and die on it. Well, maybe I'll slip on the on the pet feces. <laughs> fall, off, fall off much cliff. information. <laughs> David. I. And willing to support 12-4-6 um, as as written, but I'm also I agree with Ann and I agree with Jim. There's certainly no urgency in addressing it tonight, and I'm happy to refer it back to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee uh, for comment. I'm um, like Marianne. I'm really offended at the notion of smokers and the world is my ashtray approach to smoking. And it's fair game to just flick a cigarette butt anywhere you happen to be after you've taken your last puff or drag or whatever you do with it. Um, and the best way it seems to me to um, stop that world is my ashtray approach is to say, just don't smoke in this area. Don't smoke in the park. Smoke when you get back in your car and you're leaving the park or after you've left the park, but not when you're in the park. And I'm okay with that, recognizing that enforceability is not perfect. Enforceability is not perfect for lots of laws we have. But um, when somebody is smoking and there's someone around who can't enforce it, they can say to that person, sorry, you can't do that. And here's a ticket to prove it. So I'm okay with it. Paul and Sarah. I think that 12-4-8, uh, pet excrement removal should stay. I think that's totally reasonable to ask people to take care of their own pets. Um, as far as the smoking ordinance is concerned, I, there's probably hardly anyone who's more anti-smoking than me, but I agree with Ann. I think um, to say that people cannot smoke in an outdoor environment like that is going too far. I would love to see this change to an anti-litter 
ordinance. I have no problem with that whatsoever. And include cigarette butts as part of the litter. I think an anti-litter policy for the park would be a, a, a wise idea. I, I have problems with, you know, kids walking and throwing, uh, you know, their ice cream wrapper on the ground. And, I, you know, you see that occasionally. Um, so I think an anti-litter policy would be more appropriate in this case. I agree with you, Marianne. I, I walk, my office is in downtown Portland. No matter where you go, if you, certain parts of the sidewalk are littered with, with cigarette, the, you know, the leftover portion of the cigarette butt. And I think it's, it's um, very disrespectful of people to do that. But I don't think it's appropriate to outlaw smoking in, a, in an outdoor environment. And I have to agree with Ann in that case. So if we could change that to an anti-litter uh, policy, I, I would agree. I would uh, support it wholeheartedly. Yeah. In theory, I agree with you thoroughly, but I think in practice, there's no way people are going to pick up cigarette butts. I, I agree with what the chairman said. They, they don't consider it litter, and so I think you have to take a more draconian measure and say no smoking, and, and there's still going to be a lot of people smoking in the park because there's not going to be a policeman patrolling it day and night. But it might cut down a little bit, and it might at least make people aware that what they're doing is wrong, and therefore they might be less apt to flick their butt. So I, I, I have to agree with Councillor Becker. And the pet thing I completely agree with, too. So I say we take a more stringent measure, knowing it won't be very stringently enforced, and hope that we make a small dent in the problem. And I'm, I'm, I really like Paul's idea. Because, and I, I, I definitely sympathize with David on the world is my ashtray, that, that concept. I hate that. But what this does, if this was brought up as an anti, as a waste problem, um, which applies both to pet excre excrement and cigarette butts, it's, you know, it's all just stuff that's dumped. I could fully get behind that because that's inflicting itself on everybody else. But saying smoking, I mean, what if you have somebody who drives in, takes a couple puffs, very carefully puts it out in their car ashtray, you know what I mean? It's, to me, that's different than litter. And I'm not trying to defend smoking. I think it's, I think it's a bad habit. But um, I would rather focus the regulation on the waste aspect of it, the litter aspect of it, than, which is what affects everybody else, than on the habit of smoking. I have a question for the manager. I know we don't allow smoking on school property. Can you tell us how that came about? Because obviously some of the same arguments are. Yeah, the, the school issue, I don't remember the exact time, but I think it was the early 1980s. Uh, the school board had some sort of a health committee and there was a recommendation that came forward that we ought to be sending the message that there ought not to be smoke. <coughs> and the school board, I think, was the first school department in the state to ban smoking on school grounds. It ended up winning awards from the, from the American Lung Association, and it was really recognized at the time for being a landmark move to uh, send a, a strong message uh, to particularly the young people on that campus that, that smoking be prohibited. Since then, we've never summoned anyone uh, on the school grounds, but you know, many people have been advised that they shouldn't be smoking there. And we do require all of our contractors who are, who are on uh, school grounds, we make sure when we have pre-construction meetings every single time, just reminding them that their workers are not to be seen smoking on school grounds. But it came about that came about as, as, as a health measure and a, a strong sense that Cape Elizabeth ought to be in the forefront, uh, the school board felt at the time, in, uh, making, uh, in making smoking something that uh, should not be recognized as, a, as something that is a positive thing on school grounds. Well, Cynthia, did you? I'm fully supportive of the amendment to ban smoking in the fort. I think it's a health issue. It's a litter issue. I just, I think it, the fort is used primarily by a lot of young people. I, I have absolutely no problem prohibiting smoking in the park. It's, it, it's, it's absolutely not a problem. 
At the same time, I really don't mind referring it to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Um, but I'm very, I want to send a message to the commission that I strongly in favor of banning smoking at Fort Williams. Well, we have the main motion on the floor, and no amendment has been made. And, and the main motion is what, to approve these to approve as they these are. To approve these as they are. Let's go. All in favor? Uh, what, what, yeah, no, no. Oh, I, he had his hand up. I'd like to move an amendment. Okay. And that is that the, the Section 12-4-6 be referred to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, for its uh, perusal and recommendation. Second. All in favor? The 6-1. Opposed? <laughs> One. Okay. Okay. I have a so the, I have then a motion to refer to approve then all of the other sections, mm -hmm. excluding. Yes, I was taking okay. that as okay. second. The main motion now. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the flood plain management ordinance, and I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak on this? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. And before us is item number 121, the proposed amendments to the flood plain management ordinance. Um, this went to the Ordinance Committee, and the Ordinance Committee recommended adoption. The Ordinance Committee like to add anything else? No. Okay. Discussion? <laughs> All in favor? We need a motion. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did the Ordinance Committee make a motion? <laughs> uh, I would move that we adopt um, the uh, flood amendments plain. to the floodplain management ordinance for the town of Cape Elizabeth as they appear in our packet. And is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor? <laughs> so that to be unanimous. Thank you. And then now we are at item 122, the Alternative Energy Committee Progress Report. And Wyman Briggs is here to give us a report. I'm a resident of uh, Cape Elizabeth, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Bill Slack, who's, who we've selected as chair of the Alternative Energy Committee, who cannot make it uh, tonight, as well as the other members, to give you a briefing on, on what we've done, uh, done to date. Um, first, I'd like to thank the town for all the support you've provided the uh, committee. Um, for example, Ernie McVeigh, the facilities. Uh, uh, representatives has been virtually, virtually all of the members, uh, all of the meetings, is, and has been very, uh, very helpful in providing information to us on on cost and electricity usage, fuel uses, etc., for the school uh, buildings. We also had a representative providing information on vehicle uh, use. Um, um, Sarah has attended uh, many of our meetings, and recently, uh, Mike McGovern has also been attending uh, our our meetings regularly. Um, we we took a, we're, we're making good progress moving along on our charter. I won't re, um, repeat the charter, but our focus has been primarily looking at um, different types of alternative energies that that could be implemented that would provide a cost savings to the town uh, over time. And with that, that would also provide um, some of the secondary benefits that we've discussed in terms of reducing the town's um, carbon uh, footprint and also um, having secondary benefits in terms of education to the uh, to the citizens of the town as well as the students at the school for example if we were to do an alternative uh, energy uh, system located at the uh, at the school we've been looking uh, looking at other towns both in the uh, immediate uh, um, uh, metropolitan uh, Portland area for lessons learned and we also hope that any outcomes that we have can provide uh, benefits to other other towns one of the uh, the first things that we've done is or that we did is uh, we commissioned a uh, student at the 
Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, they have an uh, annual requirement for their Master's of Public Policy degree to do a kind of a practical thesis with a client. Um, and we sponsored, uh, we sponsored a client who's, or sponsored a student who spent about uh, seven months focusing on Cape Elizabeth. He came up and uh, visited, uh, visited with uh, and spoke with several members of the, uh, of the town staff, um, attended several of our meetings with the, uh, with the outcome being providing us a, a very um, uh, structured report uh, based on looking at six different uh, alternative energy options, some of the more popular ones that you would think of in terms of uh, solar photovoltaics, um, solar hot water, um, wind, geothermal, um, and, uh, and other proposals that we had proposed from the, uh, the committee. And, do a, uh, a calculation of the net present value in terms of whether they would be a return to the uh, to the town if they implemented those alternatives. So that uh, re report, which he did for his uh, for his master's, master's thesis, has kind of become the structure that we're going to be using for our final uh, report. In addition to the, uh, and we're taking that kind of a couple steps further, making sure that it's. Uh, Refined, and there's some areas that need a little additional uh, information, but it's going to come, you know, the, the core of our report, which we'll be submitting in, in December. Um, we've also another step that we've we've taken is in, in trying to um, provide some additional facts to the uh, the committee when we put together a report. Is we we've located an opportunity through the, uh, the state of Maine, Efficiency Maine, they had a grant application for locating an anemometer which would measure wind speed. So one of the recommendations that we're considering is placing a wind turbine either at the schools or at the transfer station. But as part of that, developing that recommendation, we wanted to see what the potential return on that would be. So uh, Efficiency Maine had a grant opportunity where at no cost they would uh, erect a anemometer for uh, a period of time, I think it's approximately 12 months, and then provide us you know, a readout of what the results is, which we could then use to um, refine that, uh, that fairly rough estimate of what the net present value for, for erecting a wind turbine would be. Um, the downside is we were one of 18 different applicants. We haven't heard back yet whether we were successful or not, um, but you know, those are our, our odds. Um, so we were hoping there would be a smaller number of applicants, which would have obviously increased our probability. Um, I think there's only two, two there's only going to be two successful uh, candidates. So we'll keep you advised as far as whether we're successful. But again, appreciate the, the support of Mike McGovern and uh, Ernie McVeigh and others in, in putting together the facts required. And I think it went through uh, um, some members of the, uh, the board as well before we, s we submitted that application. Um, another thing we've been, uh, we've been, we've had monthly meetings, have so been well attended uh, by the members of the committee. Um, we've submitted uh, three articles to the Cape Courier, kind of giving a, a kind of brief update of, of what we've been doing. We've been somewhat involved or sent a representative to the Cool Cape project, which is kind of working, uh, working in tandem. We provided some uh, testimonies to some of the, the uh, residential wind turbine um, committees that you, had, you attended. Um, we reviewed stacks of information that Ernie McVeigh has, uh, has provided. We've also been quite involved in some of the interim proposals that he's put together. Um, one, for instance, I know he was successful recently in getting, um, I think, a 50-50 match for putting in efficiency lighting uh, in the high school, I believe it's in the pool. And that's going to have a substantial. He hasn't uh, run it long enough to know exactly what the uh, what the present value uh, return to that, but it's it's going to be substantial. And part of that is because he was able to get 50-50 uh, matching and cut the cut the cost in, in half. We've been uh, we've spoken with the folks in uh, in Saco in terms of their their windmill, and we're trying again in our effort to learn lessons from other towns, so we can benefit from them. Um, both looking at you know, what the positive side for the SACO uh, wind turbines is, has been, as well as any concerns such as noise. So we're going to look at that and quantify that as much as we can. 
We have been looking into Gorham who have installed geothermal um, energy system in their schools and see what the benefits of that is. And we've also been looking at another um, town system in Maine that has put in a biomass uh, boiler in their school system. Um, one of the, uh, the more significant recommendations that, that we have in, a, in kind of expanding our mandate slightly or, or, or at least including energy efficiency as part of our alternative energy, which I think makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of in the first step in recommending, you know, changing over to a different type of energy system is to see what kind of savings you can have to reduce your overall energy usage. And while um, the, the town staff, particularly Ernie McVeigh, has spent considerable effort in, and made considerable improvement in energy efficiency, um, what we as a committee are recommending, recommending is kind of as a baseline is to start off and, and hire a professional and get a professional energy audit done of the uh, particularly the schools but also some of the other larger um, buildings in town and we have some expertise on the committee that, that are in that industry and so we've been able to put together a request for proposals to go out for a, to a competitive bid and hopefully get at least uh, three bids uh, for that and our recommendation is to, is to move that through in an expeditious manner and get that done even uh, even before our our formal um, proposal submitted in December, because that um, that our hope is to actually be able to do that soon enough that we can take a look at that and incorporate some of the high level results in our in our recommendation, because because um, that could have a and, and we anticipate that the return on the investment for for doing uh, that type of audit based on experience from members of a committee that have done that type of audit for other uh, large building systems that have been a substantial, you know, several fold. Um, so I think that's a very important recommendation. And that's part of our, our, our kind of official request um, at this meeting is to get funding for that. The estimate is $40,000 to do that type of, uh, to support that energy audit as well as some other uh, minor uh, technical support. The other um, recommendation is that while you know, the committee is, is on a good track for, for completing our initial charter um, by the end of this calendar year, that there will be, a, be some continual effort that would uh, move, uh, move forward through the end of 2010. And what that is, is, is the, the committee members that have, um, for example, are, you know, maybe making a recommendation for a wind turbine, for example, uh, or other type of alternative energy system, that having that expertise in-house and that committee up and standing to extend the duration of the, uh, the committee members so they can be involved in the actual uh, you know, follow through for some of those recommendations to make sure that they actually, uh, they actually happen. Um, so that's my recommendation that I'm, um, I'm certainly willing to address any questions you might have. Cynthia? I just have a question about the, um, the efficiency main grant that the committee applied for. Right. The, um, an an anemometer. Anemometer. Anemometer, right. Um, I think you said the measuring of the wind speed would take approximately 12 months. So should I assume then that the pilot project that the town council authorized is not going to get up and running for at least a year? Well, I think part of it is um, th there is certainly is some seasonal variation in the wind, in the wind speed. And so that's, that's a consideration. There's typically more significant winds in the wintertime than in the summertime. And there's also different um, wind profiles. Unfortunately, for the aesthetic perspectives, the higher you move up, the higher you have, uh, the more wind you have. And I think some of the subcommittee members, and I think even some presentations already here, there's, you know, it's, it's a factor of four in terms of the efficiencies you get from, from higher um, wind speed. And we'd also like to be able to take, take a look at at least two different locations, one possibly up by the transfer facility and the other near the schools. Um, because your, your investment in something like a wind turbine, you know, that's basically driven by, the, by, the average, by your average wind speed. And so we couldn't, in good conscience, make a solid recommendation not knowing what the uh, 
what the average wind speed is. So we may be able to put something up for, let's say, six months, and you get a reading that, wow, there's, you know, the reading that we're getting fully supports what the estimated wind speed is, you know, based on, uh, and, you know, based on, uh, you know, not measurements, but, but uh, projections, you know, there's, there's, there's places out there like True Wind that has, you know, a projected wind speed based on our location, but we'd rather have a real, a real measurement. So in six months, we may get a strong enough right, uh, measurement to say, you know, this definitely is worthwhile, let's go ahead and erect it, but we might get a measurement that's saying, hey, we need to see, you know, we need to see the whole full 12 months worth of measurements. Sarah? Um, if we don't get the matching grant, how much would it cost? If we were to pay for it locally, how much would it cost to put them in two places? Uh, that's a good question. We, we've, at, we've gone out to get that estimate from it. Since we've learned that the, the grant may not be as, uh, you know, a higher, a higher probability, we've gone out to get that estimate. We haven't got it yet. But as soon as we do, through Mike McGovern, we'll, we'll pass that along to you. Anne, you may, have, you may have mentioned this, and I, I missed it, but when will you be hearing back about that grant? Um, I mean, what's the deadline for the... The, uh, the deadline for submitting the grant I, was in August, and um, I'm not sure that no news is good news. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make a recommendation. I'll make a call in the next couple of weeks, but we, we have not heard you know, positive or negatively, and they, and they haven't made an indication of when they were going to tell us. We, we were expecting to have known by now. We haven't heard. So we'll, we'll make an inquiry and, and see, and as soon as we find that out, we'll again pass that along through Mike McGovern. Thank you. Wyman, did I hear you say that one of your objectives for your presentation this evening was to get an authorization of funds, or did I not hear that yes, correctly? Yes, you did hear yes. that. There's a 40, they're seeking $40,000. Uh, I think it's, it's um, on your... The town manager will speak to that Yeah, as I, well. I, and I note that in our original charge, we had authorized the town manager to spend up to $40,000 to provide the committee with technical assistance. No. no, that's the proposed amended charge that you see there, if yeah. I might. The, the original charge... No. What I'd like to do is get all the questions okay. to Wyman, and then you can speak to the funds. Yeah. Sorry, if I'm more you ask more questions for Wyman, and then we'll go right to that, David. Okay. Can I ask one more? Yes. The energy audit, um, is that for municipal and school buildings? Correct. And... Um, we, we, we would definitely do schools and we would definitely do the larger buildings. We may not be, do 100% of the municipal buildings. If, for example, one of the buildings is, is new and has brand new systems, we, we'd want to you know, be as efficient about that as possible. And do you think but the energy majority. audit will um, address it on multiple le levels? So, like, you know, seal up this window level down, all the way down to, you know, oil, a wood chip boiler versus will it be multi tiered in terms of. of Time projection and cost. Yes, and they, that they, you know, part of that, what would be requesting that audit, audit would be, you know, to provide the present value on any kind of recommendation they made, so we would, the town council could know, you know, what the return on their investment would be. But it would both be, you know, very small level, um, you know, improvements, just similar to a house. You know, you can imagine from a house audit to, we recommend you completely replace this system and, and re with a different type of system. Uh, I, I'd received an invitation to a uh, program later on this month, I believe, Mike, uh, regarding a brown bag lunch. It's tomorrow. Yeah, it's tomorrow. And I just wanted to make sure the Alternative Energy Commission was aware of that. We are. Yeah, and I think we'll have some representation. Great. I think the town will be well, well represented Good. at that meeting. Good. Thank you. I think Ernie's going as well. Uh, Michael, do you want to thank Wyman? Thank you very much. Thank you very and well. please convey our thanks to the rest of the committee for all the fine work that I'll do that. you all Thank are you all. doing in this critical area. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael, if you could speak to the appropriation I'd be, I'd be happy to. issue. Yeah, I just want to clarify, David mentioned that there was 40,000 and that I didn't use the underlining. The original appropriation of this committee was $15,000 and that was primarily to pay for the, the services of the Greater Portland Council of Governments and staffing the committee. What, what I discovered within the last month is that uh, the balance in that account was not carried forward, so that lapsed as of June 30. 
So the amount being requested is $40,000 from the overlay, uh, which, is the, which is the amount that we collect as part of the taxes above and beyond the, the, the tax commitment as a result of additional value that comes in. And so that's based on the, and I don't want to say what the estimate is because of, uh, you know, we have a request for proposals out, and, you know, that Colin asked what the budget is, and I'd rather say there isn't a budget. Uh, but this 40000 includes the energy audit cost as well as the, uh, as well as the, uh, so, some of the committee's overhead expenses. Mike, can you explain when the work would be completed? The request for proposals were going out today. Uh, they're due back in a couple of weeks, and then it's a matter of, you know, we'll see what the proposals, one of the things we've asked each of the uh, proposees is to give us their schedule of when they can do the work, and when these are evaluated, that will be one consideration. What we'd really like to do is to have the committee look at these recommendations and work toward having recommendations that might appear in, in next year's budget. Well, that's, uh, that's what I was wondering. The timing of it's important to do it now for two reasons, to look towards next year's budget, but also for both school and town, but also, uh, well, as, as Wyman mentioned, while we have a committee that's, uh, that's actively involved and has, has professional expertise in this area, it seems especially timely to do. Okay. And um, Mike, I just have a question for you. We have a copy of the Alternative Energy Committee Purpose and Charge here yes. attached. And I understand that, um, I just want to make sure I know what has changed. This is the new version, and I didn't have the old version. Yeah, thank you. I, with. I apologize. That there's two changes in this. They're both in the, the final two paragraphs. One is that the, is that the $40,000 appropriated, uh, proposed to be appropriated for the committee's work. And secondly, the committee was originally due to uh, adjourn, uh, be extinguished on December 31, 2008. And this uh, would give them an additional uh, two years to oversee the, the work that, that they're recommending and assist the, the uh, staff and the council with implementation. So those are the only two changes. And those are the I only just two want to make sure I understand. The original appropriation was 15,000. Was any of that spent? Yeah, I think, I don't know the exact amount, it was eight or 9,000. Okay, but it, what, nothing was carried forward. Nothing was carried forward, so the, the, this the is five or 6,000. So this is a, a new $40,000. This would come from the overlay that's, yeah, okay. that's right. Thank you. And, and I would like to point out some, most of this is going towards schools. Uh, the energy audit, that's where most of the cost is going to be. Sarah, I'm sorry, can you explain in layman's terms what the overlay is? Yes, when the tax, when the budget is approved, uh, there is an assumed valuation. In this case, it was one million three hundred and forty-two million or something. One bit, one billion three hundred forty-two million or something like that. When the valuation comes in higher than that, as a result of Matt keeps looking and look, looking at all the improvements, the amount of difference between the the original appropriation and the amount that we actually project to come in is the overlay. That amount is used for abatements if there's an error in, in valuations uh, or if there's any challenges in valuation. The tax bills went out this week. The amount of the overlay in the budget, in the, the tax commitment is either, I, do, I don't remember, it's either $192,193 or 193000 192 dollars. <laughs> I, I, it was. It's either one or the other, and I don't remember which it was. And then just one thought: What in past years has that gone to? Does it get reinvested? Does it cover expenses it, like the, this? The main, it covers things like this, but the main thing it covers is that there's in the last few years it's covered huge revenue shortfalls. Mm -hmm. You know, already excise tax in in August was 13,000 below the amount we anticipated. So it, it goes towards it goes towards revenue shortfalls. It, the other thing is we always estimate in the municipal budget 210,000 of overall savings in the entire budget expenditure. It's the, the, un, the use of undesignated surplus, and it also helps to provide for that, those monies in the succeeding years. It's really helped us in the last couple of years with, though, with, uh, with revenue shortfalls and state revenue sharing in, and in excise tax, and investment income was the, the other big one. But fortunately, if you recall, in many of those accounts, we reduced during the budget process our estimated revenues. So 
that, that we, we do not anticipate that problem will be as acute as it has been, as it was last year. But we are still worried about excise tax. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Just, uh, did um, we ever have an energy audit in past years? I seem to recall when I first was elected that there had been talk of an energy audit having been completed. We had energy audits done about 20 years ago. Oh. It's time. So, with that, we need a motion to amend the charter as set forth and to appropriate the money. The charter. In the charge? She, she means the charge, I think. The charter. Um, I'm, I'm sorry? I, the charter of the. You mean the charge? The char or charter change. To, to I think it's the, called the charge change, but, charge, what, charge, charge. but what, whatever. Uh, I, move, I move that we amend the committee charge so that it, shall, so that it continues until December 31st, 2010. And I also move that we appropriate $40,000 from the overlay account to assist the committee with technical resources, including energy audits for school and municipal buildings. Second motion. Discussion? Yeah, there should have been one more thing in the, the draft motion, which was a, either a C or an ABC, uh, to thank the committee for their, their report. <laughs> and I'll add that. I apologize for not putting that in there. I have one, I have one comment, and it's um, one that I have made before. I personally don't like to appropriate money off of the budget cycle because we're not um, weighing priorities, I think. Fairly. Um, that said, I have asked the manager whether this is his pr highest priority, and he tells me it is. Um, and in light of the energy crisis, I'm willing to deviate from my normal position of saying we ought not to appropriate monies out of the budget cycle because of the lack of weighing it against other priorities. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? So that to be unanimous. Okay, Wyman, thank you again, and thank you to the full committee, please. Thank you. Okay, the next item is item 123, and Michael, would you like to speak to this? Yes, uh, thank you, Marianne. You had asked me sometime in August for a, a report on what we were looking at for energy, and of I've put this together, look at the, the potential shortfall. As, as we all know, it changes every day. Uh, the good news is, since most of this was prepared in August, uh, uh, crude oil prices have gone down. The, the uh, lock-in price, when I wrote this, was 350 on Friday. The schools actually locked in 90,000 gallons at 340. Uh, crude, crude prices were almost stable today, even with Ike. They were, they, were, they, were up, they were up to 109, they were back to 106 when I just checked before the meeting. Uh, so, you know, we've been looking at locking in the municipal at 320, and we, every, it's, it's a risk, but we're getting closer there, uh, closer to that all the time. Uh, but anyway, if you look at what's projected now with, with all our different fuels, uh, gasoline, uh, heating fuel, power, it appears that we're, we're headed to a $44,000 deficit in those accounts. However, I did, working with the department heads, identify $54,000 in savings in different accounts. Uh, this includes with uh, police cruiser uh, replacement and with, uh, because of our better bond rating for debt service. Uh, so, and also uh, two per trying to save 2% of the overall energy budget as a result of, uh, you know, idling issues and, and the rest of it. So what, what I'm suggesting is that, you know, we, we recognize the, the really tough time that citizens are going through in, in dealing with their energy budgets. And, you know, it, it's, the recommendations here are that it's really more important to address the citizens' needs than it is the town council, the, the town's needs, town government's needs at this point. So what I'm suggesting is we, we have general assistance, which is, which is a, which is a, a needs-based uh, and it, it's very aggressive in terms of uh, you, you need, you know, it's, it's, it, there's still a lot of gaps. $10,000 in addition will be appropriated to the general assistance account 
the budget was six thousand no the way that works is we have no matter what the budget is state law requires us to meet the need mm -hmm. but because of the energy prices and the way they've gone up we're projecting the need will be closer to sixteen thousand and six thousand and, and again i repeat if you don't appropriate this we still have to spend the money under the law uh, secondly one of the major challenges we've had is that we've, we never had anyone in-house with the real expertise and helping citizens to understand the maze of all the different programs and availability of things to help to them. Uh, PROP in the last few years has been working with uh, quite a few communities, I think it's about 15 now in Cumberland County, uh, that's not the larger communities but they're the, 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 the communities like Cape Elizabeth and smaller. Uh, to have someone come out to the community for a day or a half a day and meet with citizens and, and help them during, during the needs. They, they, they charge $32 an hour for that service. Uh, the annualized cost of that is a little over $13,000, but assuming you know, that it could be a phone expense or something like that, I'm, I'm estimating $15,000. That would provide one day of service, and I look roughly for the person who would spend four to six hours meeting with citizens, and two hours a day for the follow-up of verifying the information. This would also be emergency general assistance during weekends, uh, which we're also required to provide by law, would be available uh, from this person. We'd try to schedule citizens in on the, on the day that the person uh, would be here. It's proposed that, that this be funded uh, with half by the town council and half by the Thomas Jordan Fund. I haven't yet asked the Thomas Jordan Fund for this. I felt it'd be more appropriate to, to see the town council first, because if the town council doesn't agree to it, there's really no sense in applying to the Thomas Jordan Fund uh, for the balance. But I, you know, the, 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 real, the real important part of this is people could apply in town for, for uh, fuel assistance from prop the federal monies. They could also access the, the general assistance monies, perhaps some other monies from Thomas Jordan that, that could help the, the gap assistance beyond what general, what general assistance provides. Uh, the other main concern I have, and you know, what I think is really helpful about this is with general assistance is, in, in recent years, the, the town clerk has been the, the, the general assistance administrator. And while you know, I appreciate the, their efforts to, to learn that, with everything else they do, it, it's kind of tough. And, uh, and with all their other duties. My, my, the other real piece of it is there's very little privacy uh, for folks that come in and, and want to have assistance. And what I'm looking at is with, with this person is would have them in a, and I'm not ready to announce yet because I haven't confirmed where it would be, uh, is to have them in, in a place where, where there would be absolute confidentiality and that you know, people would feel comfortable going and, and receiving this assistance. So the recommendation is that you appropriate from the 54,000 in savings uh, $10,000 $10, to the general assistance account and $7,500 uh, to, to the general assistance account for, this, for the services of, of PROP. It, it's, the PROP contract provides that we have to give 30, either party has to give 30 day notice of uh, whether or not you continue the service. So, you know, if it ends up citizens, you know, aren't taking advantage of this the service, we would probably discontinue it and not recommend it for next year's budget. If it appears that it, it's something that uh, the citizens are utilizing, seems to be a lot of help, uh, it will be a recommendation in next year's budget. So that's a summary of that. Is there a motion for discussion at least? Cynthia? Sure. I would move that we um, approve um, or give authorization to the manager to um, appropriate $10,000 to the general assistance account as described in item 123-2008A. Also that the town manager be um, authorized to um, appropriate half of the projected $15,000 costs associated with a um, um, social prop employee or social worker to be on site um, in addition to the um, well, and, that, and that's it. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Paul? Um, 
I have a question for Mike regarding uh, this assistance. I think this makes sense to, to me. Uh, does PROMP also provide assistance in terms of uh, residential energy audits and that sort of thing? Yeah. I'm just curious if we could incorporate that. No, they do, and that's one benefit I see of having this person, is that it also lets people know about, you know, the, 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 the what's, it's not called the WIC program anymore, but the okay. Women's Infant and Children's Program. Uh, they, they, they used to have the, the cheese distribution. Yeah. All, all the, the weatherization programs, oh, all of the different programs. I see. So it's a, it's a, it's a con yeah, to and, everything. And that aren't only offered, offered by prop, but are also offered by, you know, the, the full gamut of, of different agencies that provide assistance. Excellent. Sarah? I'm just curious how you came up with once a week. Why not twice a week, once every other week? It, it just, we're required to meet anyone who applies within 24 hours, uh, who applies for general assistance. And it just seemed that, you know, what we could try to do is, you know, sometimes people come in an emergency, we'll still have to meet with them. But for the rest of them, if we could say, you know, you, you call this number, you, you meet X day of the week at, at such and such a time with this person, it seems to us to be what the demand would be. You know, it might be, we only need it four hours a week. Uh, but it, it seems, you know, particularly with the challenges that citizens are now facing and with the calls we're beginning to get, it seems reasonable that this, this is the, it seems reasonable to us at least that, to give it a try for, for one day. And again, it's not, it's about, I look at it about six hours a day for meeting with, with citizens and two hours a day for the, you have to verify information <coughs> about the paperwork, all that type of stuff. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Show that to be unanimous, please. Okay, the next item is item number 124. Um, Public Works Director and the Town Manager are recommending that the Town Ways Ordinance be updated and they are re recommending that this be referred to the Ordinance Committee. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Please show that to be unanimous. And item 125 is uh, sewer rates. It is proposed to adjust the sewer rates. It is proposed. Who's the person proposing that? That might be me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear. The town manager is proposing to adjust sewer rates on January 1, 2009, 2010, and 2011 by 4% each year to pay for needed upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant on Spurwink Avenue. He is also proposing to raise the sewer connection fee by $500 on January 1, 2010 to $4,000. And um, he is recommending, or we're recommending, a public hearing be scheduled on these rate increase proposals for Wednesday, October 15, um, 2008 at 7.30 in Town Hall. So moved. I may make yes. one quick comment. Ann called me today and pointed out the increase of the hydraulic capacity of the plant is from 0.55 million gallons per day to 2.75. Thank you, Mike. Okay, and uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor of setting this for public hearing? Okay, Ruthie, please show that to be unanimous. The next item is item 126, and that is miscellaneous fees. And um, the following fees are recommended by the manager for adjustment effective November 12, 2008. There's uh, quite a list of fees. I'll just uh, generally point out those would be notary public fees, electric wiring and building permit fees, health permits, catering permits, planning board. Um, various other fees for um, changes in zoning ordinances, subdivision ordinances, fees to purchase plans such as the Fort Williams plan and the Green Belt, Belt plan, although those plans are also available free online. Um, and for a complete list of the fees being proposed, um, the public can find those on our website in the Town Council packet under item number 126. So 
Um, we are recommending that these fees, fee increases be scheduled for a public hearing on Wednesday, October 15th at 7.30. Jim? I would so move. Second. Second. All in. Make one quick comment. Yes, Michael. We'll, we'll have one additional change next month, and it, it involves, right now it's $50 for a permit for a wood pellet stove or a wood stove. It's, it's the secondary heating system fee, and we're going to be proposing that that be, if not eliminated for, for a period of time, it be significantly reduced. The, the, the point is we really want folks to apply for these permits, and we really want the opportunity to inspect the, the wood stoves and the wood pellet stoves. Uh, so we, we, we plan a public education on that, and as part of that, we, 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 want to, we want to have a real minimal fee so that there's some, you know, maybe $5 or something so that people, you know, actually fill out the paperwork. But right now it's $50, and we, we don't want, a lot of folks get these things and don't get permits, and we really want to encourage permits so that they're properly inspected. Okay. So all in favor of scheduling this for a public hearing for our October meeting? Okay, thank you. Please show that to be unanimous. <coughs> and item 127 is Town Council Rules and a committee consisting of myself, um, the previous uh, Town Council Chairman um, Paul McKenney, and uh, the Finance Committee Chairman uh, Jim Rowe met to review town council rules and uh, there was in your packet um, a proposed set of new rules. Um, there was also a memo from the town manager identifying most of the changes. Ann? Um, I uh, appreciate all the work that was done by the rules review committee. Um, I have a couple of issues that I think need to be uh, discussed more lengthy, sort of language kinds of rules and a couple more substantive things. But um, I would like to propose that rather than wordsmithing things now on camera in this format, that it would be more uh, easily done in a workshop format. And I um, would like to therefore propose that we postpone this and table it until our October 16th workshop. Second. Okay, so it would be tabled to the November meeting. Would you accept that as uh, yes? Table. Yes, I mean discussed at the October. The plan would be to do it at the, work it at an October workshop. Yes. And table it to the November. Yes, we couldn't make any decisions at, on October 16th. I mean votes on October 16th. Okay, so there was a motion and a second, and that's not debatable. All in favor? And I'm please show that to be unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. Item 128 is the warrant, the election warrant for the November 4th, 2000 election. And it is proposed that that warrant be approved. You're, you're approving the warrant. It'll have this, the standard provisions in it. We actually haven't received the warrant from the state, but this will allow us to see him, keep the process moving. What's a warrant? What's the what is a warrant? Uh, What's an election warrant? We're basically setting up an order for an elect to hold an election. In yeah, what you'll be doing is setting forth polling hours, which which in the which will be uh, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You're indicating that citizens uh, can come to the polls at Cape Elizabeth High School to vote in the November uh, general election as well as in the November 4th municipal election for municipal and school offices. Thank you. Okay. So it's an, one of these old anachronisms of state law. <laughs> but it also tell, I mean, it it does set the polling times. That's the important. time and the place also, yep. because yep. we could move the place around. So right. it's important. It's a legal mechanism, basically. Got okay. it. Paul. I propose that uh, the election warrant for, for the November 4th, 2008 election be approved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. Please show that to be unanimous. Okay. Um, I, before we adjourn, I'd like to announce a couple of future meetings. We have, as I mentioned earlier, a town council workshop at, uh, at 7.30 in the, Tom, in the uh, William Jordan Conference Room here at Town Hall, and that's on, on September 11th.
is Thursday night, and that is specifically on the topic of recycling and solid waste. Um, there is a um, regular town council meeting on Wednesday, October 15th. There is an MDOT public meeting on the town center intersection on September 30th. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. And uh, there is a town council workshop on October 16th, which will include our annual audit, the um, previously mentioned town council rules, and whatever else we think we need to work. So I just make those announcements again. I'm sorry, what time did, um, Mike, did you say that? The MDOT, so they wanted to have it at 6, and I, I said we prefer 7. seven. What, where is it? Here, this room. Here. And the two workshops are at 7.30? They're at 7.30, 730. our usual time. Okay. So I think a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? And show that to be unanimous.